Hello and welcome back to Slick Talk. This is your host, Blackstone Joe. Today's episode is titled All About Fuel. We use the flashpoint test to determine fuel and how much is present in a sample. So this test in particular is one that has very deep roots, both in the history of used oil analysis and in our own. So this is sort of a logical continuation to the looking back, moving forward episode, where we took a little bit of a broad stroke approach to used oil analysis in general, paradigm shifts, advancements, how the testing has changed. So now we wanted to start moving to specific tests and breaking down their origins. What, if anything, has changed over the years? What are the constants and how these tests still play a pivotal role in our analysis? So the flashpoint is a good place to start because uncovering fuel dilution is essential to many customers out there, especially nowadays with folks that are concerned about any gasoline direct inject engine or just exploring the idea of fuel system issues in general. So we're going to break down the flashpoint, what it does, how we run it, and how we can even go beyond that when determining the effects of fuel dilution. And we also have a listener appreciation segment, and we also have a very special announcement. So without further ado, let's go. It's time for a listener appreciation segment. This shout out goes to David Skaggs, sales and application engineer with Beckham Lubrication Technology. Thank you so much for stopping by the offices recently. It was great to meet you. Of course, a not only a customer of Blackstone's, but a supporter of the show. We couldn't do this show without loyal listeners like yourself. And also, of course, thank you for the care package. I loved everything in there, especially the hat. I'm wearing it as we speak. Thank you so much. It's always great to have the opportunity to meet um, our customers and listeners of the show. Really, anytime you want to check out the lab, see how we run things, get the chance to meet one of us, the president, the vice president, whoever, um, our doors are open. So it's great to hear back from you and especially meet you in person. And a shout out also goes to Gyropilot. Thank you for leaving a very kind review on Apple Podcasts. And before I read the review itself, this is also a reminder that anytime you're listening on a platform such as Apple Podcasts that allows you to leave a star rating and a written review, we always encourage that. A, we love to hear from you, but B, it also does a lot to put the show on other people's radar. Uh, More people will hear about it the more ratings, the more reviews we pick up, so we always appreciate that. This review in particular reads... If you're into wrenching and or mechanical stuff, then I think you'll really enjoy this podcast about everything related to oil and fluid analysis. I sure do. Very well done. Thank you so much for the review. A, it's good to hear from you, but B, it's great to know that we're tapping into some enthusiasms, um, some definite interests of our listeners out there, because we understand that not only are we delving into our own practices, but we want to make sure that that matches up with what you're doing outside the lab, that we're tapping into some interests, some hobbies, some, you know, often um, lifebloods of of customers out there, especially when it comes to vehicle maintenance, taking care of whatever engine, transmission you've got. It's good to know that this show is relating to real-world application. That's always going to be one of our goals. And before we get into the topic, we do have a reminder that t-shirts are coming. Yes, Slick Talk t-shirts. If you've been following our Instagram and Facebook, we just posted a photo on August 24th on those accounts. So you can see what the shirt's going to look like there. We also have trucker hats on the way too. That's just a little bit further down the line, but the shirts are coming soon. Now, we do not have any official order link up on our website yet. But with that being said, you can still put yourself on sort of a pseudo wait list just by getting in touch with us either on social media. You can email us bstone at blackstone-labs.com. Heck, you can even call. But the point is we just want to see, we want to get a feel for interest right now. 
and you can say that you're interested in the t-shirt, the size, and we'll start getting a, a wait list put together. And that will help influence our ordering down the road. We do have a batch on the way though. I'm very excited to get those in. And then as we find out sort of just how many quantity wise we need, you know, we're gonna continue to expand from there. Um, and then of course, we'll have another announcement when hats are ready, but the t-shirts are coming up. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you're interested in picking up one of your very own Slick Talk t-shirts. Again, you can see a preview of what these will look like on our Facebook and Instagram. So follow those pages if you haven't already. Okay, so now it's time to talk about flashpoints. We're gonna go to the classroom a little bit here. So when referencing timelines, major events, so on and so forth, we will be relying on the book, The Practice of Flashpoint Determination. This is written by Edmund White and Ray Montemayor. This is published by ASTM International. So if you're unfamiliar, ASTM is the American Society for Testing and Materials. Their standards are crucial in making sure that we are running um, testing that is valid, that gives you results that you can rely on. So we keep those ASTM standards and methods handy and they have really helpful descriptions, layouts of everything from different kinds of apparatus to methods, changes over the years, so on and so forth. So let's get into a little bit of definition here. The flash point is the lowest temperature at which a liquid will generate sufficient vapor to flash or ignite when exposed to a source of ignition or fire. So the flash point test, um, before I go any further, um, it's probably one of the most satisfying tests to run, I think. Um, as writers, we don't spend much time in the lab, but when we do, one of the tests we get to run is the flashpoint. It's just very visually satisfying. You pour the sample into a pre-cooled cup, you set it up on a, on a plate that is being heated to a certain temperature, and then when that flashpoint occurs, it looks really cool. It's neat. So, but beyond being visually satisfying, this is a method that not only has deep roots, but is still valid today. And we're going to get back to those roots. So the concept of the flashpoint was developed mid 19th century. And why is that? Well, it was developed in response to a spate of fires that occurred due to the transport of hazardous materials, um, you know, sale of contaminated kerosene. So the flashpoint was a much needed method to make sure that what was being sold, transport was done so safely. Okay, so we've defined what a flashpoint is, but now how do we retrieve a flash? So numerous types of flashpoint apparatus have been designed and built over the years, but the fundamental features are a sample of combustible liquid placed in a vessel in contact with the air, liquid is heated, and the temperature at which a flash is created across the surface is the flash point. So there's open cup methods, closed cup methods. We use the Cleveland open cup tester. Uh, and we follow ASTM method D92 in the application of this test. So this specifically has its roots in 1908. That's when you started having the open cup tester being put in extensive use um, here in the US. And it remains a reliable method. Again, when we're following rules and standards from the American Society for Testing and Materials, you can rest assured that we're following standards that are up to date you know, we're not simply taking a rule book that is from 1908. The test has its origins there, but the application, the validity of the results is something that is checked on continuously over the years. So yes, while it is not a test method that got start recently, recent standards oversight is applied all of the time. The scope of D92, the method itself, states that the method is applicable to all petroleum-based products, aside from fuel oils. And the petroleum-based products, 
where the flashpoint is particularly useful are, of course, diesel engine oil and gasoline engine oil. So uh, taking a brief step back, switching gears a little bit here, this topic came into my headspace after flipping through a volume of aircraft power plants. Uh, this was gifted to us by a friend of Blackstone amongst many, many other volumes regarding aircraft maintenance. And what's fun about this one is it dates back to 1955. And I flipped to a page that has a section on, you guessed it, the flashpoint. So, so far, all the terminology I've brought up is, you know, kind of a boilerplate lab resource speak. So I wanted to take it from a different source here and how they describe the flashpoint, specifically in regards to the Cleveland Open Cup. So they state that if oil, which has been used in an aircraft engine, is tested and found to have a very low flashpoint, this indicates that the oil has been diluted by engine fuel. So I think it's interesting that this is a test that in particular has such deep roots um, but is still reliable today. I also think it's interesting that you have some difference, though. If you stretch back to the 50s, it's a very crude sort of definition of determining fuel, right? So they just mentioned very broad stroke. If oil, which has been used has a very low flashpoint. You know, they don't really give you what low is, what normal is, um, but there is definitely still truth to the idea that a low flashpoint translates to fuel dilution. We take it to a different level. Uh, we want to extrapolate a percentage based on the flashpoint temperature and how low it is. So every oil is going to have a should be value and the value is going to be uh, impacted as a result of fuel dilution but it's also going to be impacted just by normal exposure repeated exposure to fuel blow by so one area i wanted to make sure to cover because this can trip people up sometimes is should be values are kind of tricky because there is a should be value for an unused version of an oil and a used version of an oil. Because that repeat exposure to fuel blow by will naturally lower that flash point a little bit. So when people sometimes find a report with a should be value that's lower than the manufacturer spec sheets, the MSDS, they might wonder if we have a valid standard to go by. And yes, we do. We understand that a used oil is going to flash differently than unused, which is why we categorize them. You know, a diesel engine oil and a unused engine oil tend to have, you know, even unused gasoline engine oil tend to have much, much higher flash points, you know, into the 400s, 400 degrees and change. A used gasoline engine oil, though, is going to be more in the threes, 380 degrees thereabouts a little higher usually. So we're not just looking at a flash point and seeing it as low and saying, that's very low, you got a lot of fuel there. No, we want to get a bit more specific for you. And we have limits that are known to indicate a problem. And we have amounts that we also tend to associate with more situational or operational explanations, which is why the mere appearance of fuel based on the flashpoint temperature, doesn't always indicate a problem. We're going to look at generally, you know, if it's an aircraft engine, 1% fuel is the cutoff. When you have 1% or more, it can indicate a problem. Diesel gasoline engines, you're generally talking about 2% and up. However, we are going to take into account other potential explanations for a high reading, such as additives. That handy question on the back of the slip, have you used any additives? Boy, is that, is that important? Um, mainly because 
products like a flush, anything solvent-based, that can lower the flash point too. So if you have a keen interest in the flash point, it is very important to let us know if you've used any, anything like that because it can lower the flash point like fuel would. Might impact the viscosity too. So let us know if you've used anything like that because if you have, it will play a role. But if you haven't used any solvent-based product and you have a low flash point, the only logical explanation for that would be fuel dilution. So let's move on to a specific example, maybe more of a hypothetical situation, but something to kind of give you some insight into where to go next if we find fuel. So say you have an engine that has a known fuel system issue. You want to use the flash point to determine how much fuel is present, but you also want to know what other impacts the fuel is having. Well, that's where the remainder of the standard analysis comes in handy. If you want to know if fuel is thinning the oil down, the viscosity will let you know. If the viscosity is below spec and we find fuel, especially a high amount, then that would be an indicator that fuel is thinning the oil down. If you want to know if fuel is impacting the oil in other ways, the spectral analysis is going to lend insight there. For example, additive elements. Those are going to be diluted by fuel if there is a high level. So most gasoline engine oils, let's just say you know, your mobile ones, really countless other brands have a similar recipe, so I hesitate to really narrow it down to one, but you'll see quite a few of them use calcium around, say, 1,600 parts per million. Excess fuel can lower that number you might even see three, 400 parts per million go missing, something along those lines. That's an impact of fuel diluting the spectral results. It can dilute metals too. So that's something we'll keep in mind when obtaining a fuel percentage. We'll then look and see if spectral results are noticeably dilute, if the additive levels are really low. That can apply to metals too. So it's something to keep in mind if you know there's a fuel system issue it's important to remember that that can keep us from obtaining the most accurate depiction of engine wear. Something else to keep in mind. So that's what I really appreciate about the standard analysis is, yes, you can check for specific contaminants, fuel, coolant, so on, but you can also get an idea of how that contamination is impacting the engine at large, the oil, wear metals, if there's anything abnormal in addition. So hearkening back to that volume on aircraft power plants, they have an interesting thought in here. It's kind of a good point to close on, I think. They talk about in testing, oil which has been used in an engine is possible to obtain more accurate results from the flash point if the sample is obtained from the engine while both the engine and oil are still hot. So this is a thought that um, many customers have when they're sampling. You know, if we send out a less than ideal result, um, be it for the flash point or anything else, um, the first thing we often hear back is, well, I did take that sample cold, so it might not be accurate, the report, right? It might, might be wrong. Well, yes and no. Um, so there, there's kind of a important distinction to make here. If you took the sample cold, that in and of itself isn't a bad thing because a cold sample can mean that you went for a long drive, you warmed the engine up entirely, you got back, you shut the engine off, and then the next day you took a sample. Yes, the engine is cold, but it was warmed up prior and there wasn't a chance for you know, small amounts of fuel just from starting the engine to creep in. So a cold sample there is not a bad thing. You can still get a valid overview of fuel, of wear metals, the whole nine. What you want to really avoid though, is you want to avoid taking a sample after just starting the engine, maybe just starting the engine and letting it idle, 
because those are ways to introduce mild amounts of fuel that can be frustrating if you're trying to pin down a specific fuel system problem. Let's say you know an engine is in for recall and you need our services to determine how much fuel is there. Well, you don't want to add in these small amounts. And when I say small, if we're talking about gasoline, diesel engine, you know, something under 2%. You don't want to introduce these mild amounts that can kind of cloud the picture about how much fuel is coming from the problem versus how much fuel is coming from something situational like just starting the engine. So yes, ideally you warm the engine up, then you can let it cool down at least to the point where it's not a hazard to change the oil. But um, don't think that your results are invalid just because the engine isn't piping hot. And even so, you know, even if you do have a sample where the engine was idled or just not warmed up all the way, don't take it as if we can't accurately determine wear metals, viscosity, check for coolant, see how oil filtration's working, so on and so forth. It's just that you might end up with some small amounts of fuel. If we find upwards of, you know, well above 2%, However, and we find fuels obviously taking an impact on additives, viscosity, etc. Then that's also a bit more than just merely a cold sample or a, you know, sample interference from operating conditions, whatever you want to call it. That's more than that can account for. So I guess for people out there who might get a bad result and kind of want to find, you know, root out all possible explanations, sometimes you have to call a spade a spade regardless of sampling. Um, but it is good to know sample conditions, how warm was the engine, because that can certainly play a role when you have those nagging amounts of fuel show up in testing. So if you want to retrieve a valid sample, by all means, warm that engine up, wait till it's cool enough to change it, and then you can get an accurate overview of fuel and of course the engine's condition in general. So that wraps up my talk on the Flashpoint today. This is, of course, not the only test we run in the standard analysis, not the only one with deep roots either. So we have many more avenues to go down when breaking into the history of used oil analysis, but this was a good jumping off point, picking a specific test and digging into methodology and what we can learn from it. So I look forward to doing more of these. If you have any questions on the Flashpoint, if you have any burning questions on just tests you really are excited to hear more about, by all means, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. And as a reminder, don't forget to submit your request for a t-shirt. However, you can reach out, be it on social media, email, phone call, reach out if you're interested in a Slick Talk shirt and we'll get your name on the list. And of course, if you haven't yet, don't forget to leave a star rating and review if you can. We always appreciate that too. That's all for today, though. This is Blackstone Joe signing off.